Well, hello everyone. It is time once again for another Q&A video. So, strap in, buckle up, whatever you have to do. Most importantly of all, if you're gonna go sticking your dippity into somebody's dew patch, try to strap out, or at least have a pull-out game, something. Otherwise, understand, there will be consequences, and not very good ones. Ask Bray Wyatt. Like, what do you think the whole reason the Fiend character was created? Because he wanted to reinvent himself. No. He wanted to get multiple payouts, create a new social security number. You know, so that way he could have his slush fun. Anyways, so make sure you subscribe. It's your first time ever checking this out. Gonna go ahead and get started. Q&A time. Again, OTR Essential is the Twitter handle. That's where you follow the show. And that's where you can get your questions asked so they can be answered here. BW Roses kicks us off. By asking, have or will you consider doing a Zoom call with the rest of the old OTRS crew, including B-Rad, for a future video like, say, the Rumble? I appreciate how you had to make sure that B-Rad was like a special attraction. Like, he's different. You know what I mean? Um, I gotta say, coming up on December 6th will be 10 years since the first time we ever did a video on the old Off the Rope Show channel. So... Stay tuned. MC17 Clark. Why don't wrestling companies have rules that heels could use to cheat and get heel heat? It's such a basic way to get heat on a heel, man. I agree. Like, there are rules, but I would appreciate a little bit more in the presentation that you emphasize those rules. The commentary would talk about those rules more. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. It's not that the rules aren't there, but they don't get the most mileage out of them. And I would agree, it's an easy way to get heat, but an effective way to get heat. Not every way to get heat has to be incredibly complex or convoluted or genius. Sometimes simple is best. Byron Andreas asked, do you feel the Oscar character is a negative stereotype? One could look at it and say that it emphasizes the Asian that can't speak English. Asian people are eccentric and goofy, and also Japanese people love screaming in their native language. Um, well, yes. Long and short of it is yes. If I've got any Asian or Japanese viewers out there, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on whether you view that as a stereotypical type of negative gimmick or you're okay with it, you're cool with it. Like, it's weird because sometimes these wrestlers, the males or the ladies, will get these types of gimmicks that, you know, obsessively on the surface just look incredibly prejudicial, if not flat out racist, but then they get pushed, so they make a lot of money doing it. So it's like a, a catch-22 there. Um, but I could certainly see that, yes. I could see it. I don't know if I totally agree with it, but I don't know that I would totally dismiss your thought process here. Jamie Um 88 asks, I was impressed by how AEW has built its tag team division. My question is, do you think they have done the same effort in building solo acts? If you look at the women, no. Um, they've done okay with the solo acts, but they're a little tag team heavy, like almost too tag team heavy, in my opinion. Um, leave it to a wrestling fan. Ooh, we won't go tag team wrestling, then you get more tag team wrestling, and then you get a bitch about it. But, um, yeah, they probably could have done better with some of their solo acts so far, I must admit. Um, but one of the good things about doing the amount of investment in the tag team division that they have is that that could eventually spawn singles guys and single stars potentially and create new rivalries. Uh, Volfan0531, John Cena reportedly would come back if WrestleMania had an audience. Who would you throw at him? Well, it's interesting because he worked last year's WrestleMania and that didn't have a crowd at all. Like they were in the performance center for God's sakes, yet he still technically worked WrestleMania. Um, <laughs> but to answer your question, like I'm surprised you have to answer this question. I'm surprised that any of you would ask this question because I would think that all of you would know there is only one answer. Fans, no fans, but yes, I, I ultimately would love to save it for a stadium full of people. It's John Cena versus Randy Orton at WrestleMania. One-on-one, -on -one, and this time it counts. Like, and you can throw in a career stipulation. You can do any number of things there. Like, you can just make it about ego and bragging rights and man, Make it about breakfast club business, and that's going to be a few. MJ Make a Podcast asks, 
Who would you like to see our tribal chief feud with after he humbles Jey Uso again at Hell in a Cell? Um, you could go from Jimmy to Jimmy if he's ready to roll. You can go to Samoa Joe. And everything's got to point to the Rock at Mania. And then after that, you know, Brock Lesnar perhaps. Um, you got months and months of what you could do with Roman. So um, I'm excited to see what they would do. Uh, I think you could go down the Joe route. I think you could also naturally go down the Jimmy route, potentially. Why not? He's a family man. He looks after his family. He doesn't want to just single out Jay for this opportunity. Dave G asks, If WrestleMania 22 went as planned with Eddie and Sean, Batista versus Orton, Taker versus Angle, would it have been in the top five of best WrestleManias? Um, hmm. Maybe. I don't know how well Taker and Angle would have worked at a mania, though. Um, I'd be remiss to take that spot from Mark Henry. That's all I'm saying. Um, the Den Sidron asks, What do you miss most and what do you miss the least about TNA? It's all the same thing. It's how emotionally invested they could get me to the point that I would react no matter what whether it was phenomenal or whether it was an absolute flaming dumpster fire garbage BS. Like, I miss the ability to emotionally connect with a wrestling company like that. Now, that doesn't mean it's always positive, but I miss that. You know, like, I'm getting some of that right now with SmackDown, but not nearly to that degree. Like, TNA, it was kind of one of those things because I, I had been watching off and on over the years since day one. Like, I watched the first ever pay-per-view the weekly pay-per-view and watch those for years. And like, there was a significant amount of emotional investment there. Um, there's also like the thing I miss. And I think the thing that I miss doing this now, doing these videos and certainly my videos miss are those things that I can absolutely rant about. I just don't have those as much, you know, nearly move me to the same levels. So uh, those are the things that I miss. Um, Rockstar Tay, how come The Rock hasn't publicly acknowledged our tribal chief Roman Reigns as being head of the table and leader of the family? Um, because he's full of himself. He thinks, oh, I'm the big muscle-bound movie star. I'm the highest paid actor in the world. I'm the tribal chief. Yeah, bitch. We'll see you at WrestleMania. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. Yeah. He'll be saying it then. Joseph Moran, who is more likely to show up at next year's uh, Royal Rumble, The Rock or CM Punk? That is a fascinating question. I'll put money on The Rock if I had to put money on one of the two right now. I think it's The Rock. I don't think either one of them show up at the Rumble. But if they did, I would put money on The Rock right now. Uh, WTF is a Manix ass. Who would you choose to beat the Tribal Chief? For the world title down the line, I'm stuck between Big E or Keith Lee. Why do I even have to be asked this question right now? Why do we even have to entertain this? Here's a newsflash. I'm not even entertaining taking the belt off of him until next summer. At the very earliest, and even then probably still not. As a result, there's no point in me. Like, build up a Keith Lee, big, build up a Big E, and see what happens down the line. But I'm not thinking about taking the strap off of Roman. Are you freaking kidding me? No, stop that. Stop that. Horror Movie Review 73. Which WrestleMania booking decision was worse? Austin turning heel at 17 or Daniel Bryan losing to Sheamus in 18 seconds at WrestleMania 28? It's Austin turning heel at WrestleMania 17. And I can't believe you would throw Daniel Bryan job into Sheamus in 18 seconds into that same category and into that same classification. That's not even close. Not even close. There are many more booking decisions that were worse at WrestleMania than Brian losing to Sheamus in 18 seconds. But Austin is at the very top of that list for turning heel at 17 in 2001. Apoor Shankar. Should we all blame The Rock for the WWE not trying to create new megastars anymore, seeing how it was him who got too big for the company and walked out, ultimately leading Vince to decide... Uh, from now on, the biggest star in the company will be the WWE itself. 
Uh, he was one part of that, but you also got to think back in 2002, that's when Austin picked up his ball and went home for several months. Then they did actually, if you remember, invest in Brock Lesnar heavily. Like they were giving him the moniker, the next big thing. They had stuck Heyman with him. Like there was clearly an emphasis on trying to make Brock that next dude. And then he left to go play football after WrestleMania 20 in 2004. So you can't just put it on the rock. It's a combination of factors. But, but it all led to, to your point, of them not wanting to make anybody bigger than the logo, if you will. Bandelier asks, what did you think about the Last Ride Undertaker documentary? And what do you also think about them doing a 30 Days of Taker in November to celebrate 30 years? Been a fan since 2012. Thank you for checking me out all these years and watching, and hopefully you've provided been provided some enjoyment. I have not watched beginning to end of the Last Ride documentary. It is on the bucket list of things to do eventually. Uh, 30 Days of Taker in November to celebrate 30 years certainly makes sense to me. Like, it's a shame with the current environment, like, Survivor Series 2020 would be the place to have The Undertaker truly, legitimately, actually have his last match. Like, bring everything home full circle 30 years later. I don't know that that's going to happen, though. And it would suck to do that and not have any fans there. Christian Mingle asks, Tribal Chief or Doctor of Thugonomics? Really? Really? Tribal Chief. Javier Artavo, what is your favorite AJ Styles match? Um, this is it back 2005, Hidden Joe and Daniels? Probably. Probably somewhere back in that 2004-2005 time frame. Eric Rivera Cueva. On what night should AEW second show air? Um, you could do Sunday night? Like, make it like some of the old syndicated WWE and WCW shows that would air Saturday night or Sunday night. I think it would potentially make sense to shoot, show them there. Edsel4, when did you find out about the Psycho Sid story uh, about jumping off the second rope? Was it before or after it happened? Well, I, I would certainly hope it wasn't before it happened. It was after it happened. It was, it was a little bit a while afterwards, but not that much longer. It was maybe a couple of years. And then after that, it just rolled in ever since. Like, it was funny to me before, but once I found out the backstory, like, that was an entirely different level. But yet and still, you will find me to find Sid, defend Sid as much as anybody online, period. It's a legend. Wrestling rants. How much different could wrestling look today if ECW didn't have the issues that they did and they were still around to this day? I don't know. Did ECW really truly have that long-term staying power? I don't know if they did. And even if they did, they'd probably be similar to what we see out of Impact Wrestling now, the old TNA. That's what I would think. Fork 34, if Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels remained in WWE during the Attitude Era, do you think it would have halted Austin and Rock's rise to the top? Yes. Absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind. It may still have eventually happened, but those two clowns would have gotten the F in the way. They certainly would have. Uh, Fulio Georgian 1, will you watch Bound for Glory 2020? Don't put any money on it. Matt Mefe. Which of these dream matches do you think needed to happen the most? Hogan Flair in WWE, Hogan Austin, Hogan or Undertaker Sting, or Rock HBK? It's always weird to me that Rock HBK is throwing out there as a true dream matchup. So I quickly eliminate that from the list. The other three, um, if you were trying to culminate a truly well-written invasion angle, Hogan versus Austin in some capacity at WrestleMania 18 would obviously make a world of sense and been the right move. Undertaker versus Sting became a dream match for so many, for so many years. But goddamn, you had Hogan and Flair in the same company at the same time in 1991-92, and you build up to WrestleMania 8, and you don't go there? Like, that had to be the one, especially because WCW, a couple of years later in 94, ended up doing it any damn ways. That's the one. And the white sensation closes this out by asking, knowing the outcome of WrestleMania 18, do you think Jericho winning the undisputed title of Vengeance was the right call to make that night? Or should they have chosen someone else involved in the double main event? Um, no, I think he was the right choice. I think he was absolutely the right choice. Because if anything else, it gave him something that you could build the entire character off of for the rest of the decade. And that's what he did. Um, you know, So I think it, I think it made perfect sense at that point to have him sit there and do that. I absolutely, absolutely do. So anyways, that's it for this Q&A. Again, thank you to everyone that submitted your questions. I have fun with this. Do it again next week. Again, make sure you smash that subscribe button, like the video, leave your comments and your thoughts on the different questions. I'll see you later.